Susie, 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 I am so blessed to have you with me again. I know. This is amazing. This has been a jam-packed week. Yes. Let's get to it. I'm Anthony. Welcome to No Vacancy Lives. That's my friend Glenn. You're watching the number one show in hospitality. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to No Vacancy Live. I, of course, am Glenn Hausman. And filling in today, we got the incredible doctor, producer, Suzanne. Water brought to you by uh, Leftovers from Delta Airlines. So great to see you, uh, Suzanne. So listen, now that I know you used to be called Susie, and I'm sorry to call you Susie a little bit, there's a song <laughs> called Susie Greenberg that I cannot get out of my mind. So I'm always going, Susie, Susie, <laughs> Susie, Susie. It's all uh, good. Like I said, as long as it's not Susan, we are okay. So go for it, Glenn. Yeah, how do you how do you figure out what your nickname's going to be? Because mine, they just short mine to G because, you know, that whole syllable is really difficult for people to get out. It's, it's those two ends. That they just got to cut the whole thing off for you. Um, honestly, I don't, I think probably my grandmother, but she, yep. um, obviously Suzanne has a Z in it, but no, she called me Suzanne. Um, but she would always do two Zs. I, I don't know. Um, I don't know. You know, right. grandparents, they do weird things. Oh, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> welcome to No Vacancy Live. You know, today is, uh, was it uh, International National Wildlife Day or something? It is World like Wildlife Day. World Wildlife Day. All right. Thank you. I wasn't sure if it was the United States, intergalactic. I don't, I, I get confused very easily over these things. So I thought today, and by I, I mean uh, Dr. Producer Suzanne over there, thought we should do things a little bit differently. And I love this idea. So today we're going to be taking a look at African safaris, but not from the safari point of view necessarily, but from that of an amazing wildlife photographer. I don't know about you, Suzanne, but that's something that I am so wanting to do more than I think any of those bucket list trips I had. Honestly, when you when you start to see some of the photographs that come out and be like, yep. oh, my goodness, if I could do that, like, mm, that's, you know, it's I'm adding it to my bucket list. Yeah, for, uh, for sure. All right. So let's welcome to the show, Dave Burns. How are you of Dave Burns? I'm great. Thanks for having me, guys. Hey, this is so, so great to uh, so great to see you here. So uh, this is really cool that you you take all of these uh, these great photographs. And for those of you listening to our audio feed, we're going to be featuring some of those photographs today so don't worry in the show notes I'm going to put a link so you can check them out and follow along with us so uh dave how does one become a photographer shooting incredible wildlife in throughout different countries in africa and get people to pay to come along with him what a great <laughs> well if i knew that uh, marketing's the tough part of the job if i knew that i'd write a book and retire um well, yeah, guess what? Writing books does not help you retire. By the way, go to theadapters.net or uh, buy the adapters on Amazon. See, I'm already off on the wrong foot. I'm going the wrong direction. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. I've always I've had a camera in my hand all my life. I can't remember uh, even being a kid not having even, you know, the little Kodak, Kodak Instamatics. Yep. Always had a camera. Um, it's always a passion of mine. And then about 25 years ago, Yep. I was just out of college, another passion, and saved up my pennies, and I went to Africa for the first time, 1997, and I uh, was, uh, this is a very abridged version of my my origin story, uh, I was friend, or remained friends with the guy who ran that trip, Yep. and years later, I was on another trip with him uh, somewhere else in the world, and I was loaded down with cameras, and he said, have you ever considered doing that, uh, doing this? Uh, for a living. I said, well, yeah, I'd love to. Um, yeah. I'd have to think about how to get started. So he said, well, let me write some letters of introduction to people I know in Africa. And uh, well, very long story short, here I am. That's really uh, awesome. So how much does it frustrate you that people still insist that and calling it Africa as opposed to noting that there are six <laughs> plus countries? <laughs> uh, you know, there's there's two answers to that. One answer is it's frustrating. Uh, I have even had someone ask me who the president of Africa was. Oh God. Um, which uh, you know have to be gentle with the response there. Uh, there are many countries in Africa. Africa isn't. Uh, I have to tell people that the 48 states fit into Africa three times. It is yeah. a huge continent. Um, but I said there's there's two sides to that. The other side to that is. That is what helps me 
that is what helped create my niche as an agent. Yeah, right. Help people get there because you know um, I'm sure other people watching this who might be agents for say places in Europe will scream at this response. But right. you know if I want to go to London or Rome or Paris, I'm a comfortable traveler. I'm going to book a ticket online. Right. I'm going to book a hotel and I just go. Uh, yeah, uh, and, I, whoop, whoop, I, I hear them yelling right now. Yeah, I'm sure they're screaming because uh, <laughs> I understand that there's a, a lot to offer. <laughs> hear me out. Yeah. But uh, for better or for worse, uh, Americans aren't, uh, at least a few generations ago, are, are not very well educated in world geography and right. there are perceptions of Africa that persist. And so it's a scary place to travel to and they want someone to hold their hand. And that's where ignorance of Africa has been a boon for me. Yeah, that's uh, that's really uh, fa fascinating. So, all right. Um, how, what is the, the desire for people to go to, uh, to one of the countries in Africa and go on safari? And it's important for people to understand uh, Africa could be very different, Northern Africa mm -hmm. and then Southern Africa and the, the, the lush forests in the middle. It's all mm -hmm. super, super different. So, where are the places that people want to go most these days? And I know you're going to be hitting three countries this year, I believe, if not more. I am. I've got I've got some good travel coming up this year to, to different places. Uh, you know, you're right. There are different regions of Africa with with different thing. You know, things you would want to go for. Yep. So, so uh, typically, I'll do sub-Saharan Africa. So sub-Saharan yep. means anything out of northern Africa. So I, I don't do Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia, uh, Libya, Algeria, things like that. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, uh, th I do things that are more commonly associated. If you with ever do stuff. plan a trip to Tunisia, though, I want to go see the old Star Wars sets. I understand oh, they yeah, made that would be so cool. Too. I have a friend who did that. He had amazing <laughs> photographs. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, but but yeah, and you know, South Africa. We all know it's uh, it, it, very developed. You can go uh, to wine country there. It's not even just wildlife. There's loads really? of things yes. There. But mm -hmm. but uh, I concentrate on uh, mainly East Africa with mm -hmm. uh, more savanna type landscapes cool. uh in july i am doing an extension to rwanda to see the mountain gorillas wow um which i'm really excited about uh gosh i mean i've been to namibia a long time ago where uh the closest landscape i would compare to for americans is the american southwest right mostly desert the tallest sand dunes in the world right. uh lots of wildlife still so it's just gorgeous is rwanda your first trip there or have you done that location before as this well? is my first trip to rwanda yeah so Oh, that's pretty oh, cool. Um, when, you, when, when you plan a trip to Wakanda, let me know. I'm really <laughs> psyched forever. to see all that technology. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so that, that's pretty cool. All right. So we're going to take a look at some of these uh, photographs and, okay. and talk about the inspiration and stuff behind them. But before we do that, you know, one of the cool things I think about going away uh, on one of these safaris is you get to stay in these camps and stuff like that. And one of the yeah. things that you do is you've partnered with some folks. So you get to really stay in like a uh, luxury lodging tents that kind of move around with you and stuff in some cases, right? That's true. It's um, it, it's unfortunate that even the word tent is used because it's really glamping and yes. extreme. It's, it's, they're more canvas cabins. Uh, like, think, uh, think tents that were in like Indiana Jones movies. Well, you know that sort of I, I say think, um, think like out of Africa or Ernest Hemingway, right. uh, uh, mm -hmm. Ernest Hemingway, um, Hemingway style tents, right there. You can stand up. They have a king size right. mattress. There are shower and toilet right. in the tent, hot running water. Uh, the type of tent that you'd expect two guards to be standing out holding <laughs> like that, right? <laughs> You're not suffering at all. No, <laughs> yeah, definitely not. I'm sure the, uh, the, Food is amazing. Look at these birds. What are we looking at here, generally speaking? And then we could drill down to some of the thematics that you're picking All up. All right. So I don't know. Uh, I gave uh, I gave Suzanne uh, about a dozen photos. And we have what, them. I don't know what order they're coming in. So they're I'm, a uh, numerical I'm... order this time. Dan. <laughs> <laughs> okay. These are. Uh, these are three uh, white-faced bee eaters. And the reason I, I uh, chose this was, uh, um, and there's a couple other examples in the set. Right. Lots of people, oh, uh, I'm going to on safari. I, I want to see elephants and lions and giraffes. And I said, sure, you're going to see those. I want to make sure people know there are loads of other animals, other species mm -hmm. you're going to see. Right. And you're going to see a lot of them. Um, you know, the Serengeti, 
Maybe you don't like birds, but you have to know the Serengeti has over 500 unique species of birds. You just well, and usually you see them sitting on elephant heads or on hippos and stuff. Yeah, like there's that. one of those coming up. Uh, <laughs> in the set, I know, but so this guy. Oh, yes, uh, I do recall that now. Yes, sorry. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if the pictures are big enough, but you'll see on the one on the right, there's an insect in his mouth, and this guy is perched there. He eats. He goes back down to the ground, mm -hmm. uh, picks oh, yeah, up a, a new insect comes back up so hence the name white face yeah, uh, that's pretty that's pretty cool what what is the frequency that you're able to capture an image such as this with the three birds all looking in different directions but one like in the middle of i guess you said landing uh i mean you're gonna see these birds um it, the question really is it, it, i'll talk about this later because i threw yeah. a, a, one of the other photos in the set i chose first to make a specific point and this oh. is the counterpoint, which is this you probably do need right. a big lens. Uh, I understand. All right, let's move on to the next one. So this, this leopard uh, hanging on this branch, he looks like he's looking at you. He's actually looking over my shoulder, probably mm -hmm. at some gazelle behind me. Right. Um, so they're just beautiful. I'm kind of glad he's not really looking at you then. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, and maybe if we have time, we we'll talk about it later, you know, one of the things I really deal a lot with right. uh, when people want to go to Africa is they have fear. And um, there are different kinds of fear, fear of this and that. And one of them, obviously, is the wildlife. Uh, I, I hear a lot, you know, oh, I'd love to go to Africa, but I don't want to get eaten by a lion. Uh, because we read those stories in the news every those single the, day. You know, those are the stories that make Dude, it I went the to news. mail the other day and I almost got eaten by a lion. So I get the concern. <laughs> those are the stories that make it in the news. But what you don't hear about the many millions of people who don't. Right. Problem, right? <laughs> That's um, true. Great headline. Today, people did not get eaten by a <laughs> lion. Millions of people spring. had a very enjoyable and safe safari. <laughs> right. So, um, so I don't so want to hear lions and leopards and all that. They're obviously very different uh, creatures. But uh, this is not a, a pose that I've typically seen before when it comes to wildlife photography of any big cat. So this is, uh, that's interesting you say that. That's probably uh, true. You see them uh, maybe walking or, uh, or or hunting or something like that. But this this guy is, uh, this actually is not uncommon. He's hanging out in the tree. Uh, the way he's seated means he's probably a boy leopard. Mm -hmm. um, and and the point I usually use this photo to make is- well, Why? Because his, uh, his, his hand's down his pants? Well, watch uh, <laughs> Let's just say he's not straddling the branch like a right. <laughs> uh, uh, But you know, people people see this, and I, I show it to them because I like the photograph, and they're like, "Oh, this is a little too menacing for me." And it's like right. you have to know that when we roll right up to a pride of lion ten feet from the car, uh, they ignore you. Right. In mm. fact, they're, the they're, they got to be used to it by now. Like they, these animals the have been thing. through it their they, whole lives. They don't see. They don't. You're not. You don't get out of the car. Obviously, right. it's not great. So. Um, Unless you want to make the evening news. <laughs> right. What they see is a metal box that rolls up. Right. And uh, um, and so they just kind of ignore you. Oh, that's really uh, that's really fascinating. All right. Next photograph. So this was one of the most exciting moments I've had on this Safari. Is pretty this insane. was a mother cheetah, four cubs, and we witnessed a hunt from uh, start to finish. Ooh. This is uh, off the southern tip of the Serengeti. And at first, we just saw her walking along and uh, the four cubs following her. And she made some motion. They hunkered down and stopped following. Mm -hmm. She crouched into a commando position, right. crawled up, and there's a herd of gazelle. And we can't believe we're excited, but we're trying to you know, stay quiet. And even faster than you've seen on uh, portrayed on Animal Planet Discovery right. Channel, she's off. So uh, it's hard to follow her with the naked eye and right. you just see a cloud of dust where the gazelles are, what's happening. And she walks out with a gazelle in her mouth. Oh my and God. Here we are. She has brought it back to her cubs, uh, feeding and, um, they feed while she stands guard. Right. Because, uh, cheetahs are actually pretty defenseless, uh, pretty, um, they're fast, but they're not strong cats. Right. So they because have to they're eat. fast. They don't need to be necessarily be strong. Right, and they need to eat quickly before uh, right. hyenas, lions, other scavengers come up and steal the kill. 
So they have a lot in common with my teenagers. <laughs> Her body almost reminds me of a greyhound. So probably with that speed, so actually, that, for, that for hind for physiological area. reasons, physiological reasons, it's exactly the same. They have huge right. lungs and heart, and everything else is sleek and built for speed. Fascinating. I, I didn't know that. So when you grab a picture like this, how many photographs did you have to take <laughs> in this instance to get the one that you love? Well, uh, I. The, the two answers to that are, are uh, this was probably eight, 10 years ago, and mm -hmm. I took way too many. And right. nowadays, if it was the same situation, one of the things, you, uh, the skills you develop as you do this more and more is you become less trigger happy because you yes. understand animal behavior more, right. you're calmer, you know when the moment hasn't yet arrived and when the moment has passed. So right. it probably would take a lot fewer. Because the most frustrating animal behavior is having to uh, be the animal looking through thousands of pictures to get the uh, the one on your computer screen at home. You so. know, I see I, I see photograph photographers coming back from Africa and it's almost a bragging point. Like, I took 5,000 photographs and I took yeah. 10,000. And it's like, I don't want to have to go through all that. Yeah, I, uh, yeah totally. That's a I tremendous amount. Handle. Yeah, I can't even handle watching a clip of this show, let alone uh, having to go through 10,000 photographs. Uh, so, uh, Dave, how has that changed then since when you first started your career and you were using the Instamatic and you had to worry about the cost of film and all of that kind of stuff? How does that inform you differently about your styles and your skill and all of the stuff that you bring oh to uh, photography now? Uh, well, you know, having uh, – wow, uh, it's a great question. Thanks. Um, so I, my first safari 25 years ago was film, all yeah. film. And I, gosh, I remember bringing it all stuffed into lead bags so the airport x-ray machines didn't ruin the film and you had to keep track of what was exposed and all the stuff of film. So photography now is infinitely better. Right. Uh, if people, I've actually sent clients on safari with film cameras and that's a fine aesthetic choice. Right. But don't tell me it's technically better or easier. Um, things are lighter weight things are easier to manage and you know the, the honest answer is the person who shoots five thousand photographs we we laugh but that person is probably more likely to get the photograph he wanted or right she, yeah she, well particularly uh, if you have an amateur doing it i'm going to be super trigger happy because right. a once in a lifetime experience potentially what's, what's the cost what's, right. what's the incremental cost for taking 10 versus one take it right. throw, throw nine away yeah you know, right you know, it's great it's well, I used to use so those. I used to use those lead bags. My first camera I got when I was 16. I saved like all of my restaurant money <laughs> to be able to get it. So I I know that old day of like traveling and having to use that lead bag. <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, what an ordeal! <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> for, for, for sure. So, uh, uh, Dave, that really, you know, um, it, it's interesting that photography has changed so much. And one of the things that I noticed, at least in the, the digital world, um, people don't put as um, much into the amazing skill that you have because the technology has been democratized and it appears as if everyone can do it. But everyone can't. And the reason why I say that is because I witnessed this happen in the music video editorial world back in the 90s when I was helping run a music video company that focused on hip hop videos. My buddy who ran it, super, super talented. But then they're like, well, we could just pay somebody to do it on their laptop for no money, not recognizing they don't have the skills to bring to the, uh, the table. So how has this affected you? Because – Average person isn't getting a photograph like this. You, one. you know what I do is I say what the, what the digital revolution has done for less skilled photographers is it has made there used to be a pretty one to one correlation between how skilled, how much time you'd put in to develop your skill and the quality of your results. And now that's changed. I think getting an 80 percent good result mm -hmm. is extremely easy now. It's made that. Right. But getting a 100 percent great result is still as difficult as ever, because now it's not about the technology. You have to know. Uh, you have to know what picture to take, and you have to. Know, it's you can't just leave it on auto mode. You need to start making artistic decisions with right. the controls on the camera uh, that that you may not have the training to make. I, I remember yep. many years ago being in a darkroom class, yep. and uh, I was a couple years in to the program and um, we were watch uh, the professor and I were watching the uh, beginner students struggle a bit. And he, he said, you know, the thing is, this is the easy part. 
knowing what to take a picture of. Right. That's the hard part. Right. And this is a, a beautifully composed uh, photograph that tells, I think, a, a great, a great story. What do you see here when you look at this picture of uh, a series of flamingos following uh, the lead flamingo or one that's about to make yeah. a move or some sort? So this cluster of flamingos had been uh, uh, parading around Lake and uh, We were there at sunrise and there were hundreds of them. So one of the tricks to photographing flamingos wow. is actually isolation mm -hmm. uh, because it's very easy to take a picture of this huge field of flamingos and come, it just come, you don't know what to look at. There's birds everywhere. So the trick mm -hmm. is trying to isolate and tell uh, a, a story within the larger field. Right. And uh, I noticed these guys had started to line up and were building, building up speed. And uh, and so I zoomed in tight, made sure I was in focus and everything looked good uh, technically. And then I just followed them. And when the lead yep. uh, spread his wings, that's when I, uh, I took a couple frames. Right. And one of the things I dig about this compared to other safari pictures is the palette because yep. These are, uh, you see gr a nice gray monochromatic background and some pink. Yep. And uh, and normally, you know, lions are sort of a, a, a yellowy tan, elephants are gray. It's, it's just a refreshingly right. different picture. You just see color. such vibrant colors in yeah. that type of atmosphere. Now, this next photograph, everybody, is absolutely I don't know what's coming. spectacular. <laughs> well, it's actually uh, my high school picture. It's a picture. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is a phenomenal uh, photograph. There's so, much depth, changed. there's so much depth and story here. Um, these are baboons. These are all of baboons. Baboons right. these are the type of baboons you'll see in Tanzania. Mm -hmm. uh, this is in Terengiri National Park, and they have extremely strong uh, family units, troop units uh, uh, with strong bonds. And I just noticed this mom. The, the babies tend to cling to mom's chest yeah. in this way, and so I just kept my eye on them. Mm -hmm. And uh, dad came over to uh, to nuzzle, to communicate. I'm not quite sure. And it just right. uh, the baby and I, I was taking a couple frames and then uh, the baby turned right to look at me and there's a catch light in his eye and I, I snapped the frame and um, beautiful. Love it's it. really awesome. There's so much story in this particular photograph and it like um, it just shows me like how human animals could be at least our perception and putting that on them and how all animals in the mammalian family are in some way kind of the same so i i i really i, I love the intimacy of this picture like you're capturing a, a moment that most people never get to mm -hmm. see in person and it, there's nothing like uh when i when i'm on my trips and i'm giving advice there's nothing like eye contact to create mm -hmm. a bond between the viewer of the photograph and the subject yep. Now this uh, this next picture, uh, someone should really tell the lion dinner's face in the other direction. He's totally, <laughs> totally rocking, walking the wrong uh, way here. But what a great, what a great photograph right here with him in focus, and then everything uh, kind of a little bit blurry behind him, which draws the emphasis on the the lion centered in the front of the picture. So the, there's really two sides to this, uh, or two angles on this, the story behind this one. Uh, one is patience, and one is the, getting uh, the quality of good local guides. Mm -hmm. So so we, uh, this is in a location in northern Tanzania called the Ngorongoro Crater, and we went mm -hmm. down at sunrise, and this li male lion was lying by the side of the road. Wasn't a very interesting photograph. Right. Um, you know, other cars came up, snapped a few pictures. And then moved on. Too much happening, drove on. He said, you know what, let's hang out for a bit, our driver. Um, and I said, okay, I'll take his advice. And sure enough, within a couple minutes, the, li uh, the line got up and he started wandering. We're about half a mile away from this herd of wildebeest. Right. He started wandering over to them. And we said, oh, this could be, this could be pretty interesting. Um, it's always a little ghoulish when you think about that. But yeah, uh, I know. But you want those great photographs. So this could be interesting. So he said, "Well, okay, let's let's uh, let's take the car and head over that direction." So the lion, and so we did. Um, and the lion, the the wildebeest are lined up, kind of in a line, staring at the lion. He has their attention, and he ends up just walking back and forth right. along them, sort of like in an old war movie. You see the the general reviewing the troops. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> why isn't he like? Why isn't he attacking? Um, right. Well, that's like what I do when I review the buffet at a casino resort. 
you have to you have to assess before you you have to look yeah, at dessert. Right. You have to look at dessert before you pick your own. That's right. You got to got to see everything. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so then, believe it or not, so we're like we're poised. We're like you know, motor drive is on. You know, we're ready for action. Turns around, he walks right to where the driver has stopped the car. We had two vehicles walk right, and he I was in the back of this one vehicle, and this lion walked towards us and right past the back of the vehicle and kept going past. And later and I said, right into a seven 11 across the street to buy a pack. Yeah, I just wanted a, one of those, you know, day old hot dogs. So, uh, so later it's like Man, hi, to, our, to the guide, how did you know he was going to do that? Mm -hmm. And he said, Oh, well the pride, the, the, the females with all the cubs were over here. So I just put us right on the line between him and the, and the rest of the pride. Fascinating. Yeah. Right. Uh, you know, well, a, sorry, go ahead. Gordon's got a great question in terms of, you know, how do you think about it without getting eaten and, you know, that charging sense? <laughs> well, Gordon, so, uh, I mean, again, you're in a vehicle. So the trick is, uh, the trick is just positioning and patience. And, you know, one of the other things at the beginning. And, and throwing the smallest member of the photo <laughs> tour. Remember, you don't have to run fast. You just have to run faster than the slowest person. Um, <laughs> You know, one of the things, though, I give a little, you know, half hour talk before the group heads out into the parks. And one of them is, hey, guys, we're not at a zoo. I know we're all adults. I know I don't have to say this, but I apparently I've been in situations where now I have to say this. Don't bang the side of the car to get their attention. Don't whistle. Right. Um, if they don't look at you. Sorry, man, you didn't get the shot. Yeah. Um, but, you know, with great guides and great patience and planning, you'll get the shot. Yeah, uh, the animals will look at you, and you and you have to be ready. Yeah, and that's the whole thing is the the patience that's issue. Patient. You have to wait for that moment. And uh, in looking through your your website, you know, one of the questions is, and the fact things the FAQs is how long do you go out for? Well, it's a whole depends thing, right? Depends on what you see. Right. Depends on the weather. Depends on this, that, and the other thing, and a whole lot of factors. But you can't put a time limit on getting great pictures like this. Now, again, we're looking in black and white. Yeah. This is a very beautiful fo uh, photo of a, uh, a herd of elephants walking together with the babies in the middle and stuff like that. Um, this is this is a beautifully composed as well because we know elephants to be so big, but yet here it seems to me is you're really capturing the the vast wilderness right. of the, uh, the Serengeti. So one of the ways I've evolved as a photographer and that I try to tell uh, my clients who come with me are, you know, there there. Are, there are only so many what we call animal portraits you can take. After a while, it's here is a picture of a lion. Okay, here's another picture right. of a lion. And after a while, it's like, okay, there's nothing new being offered to me here. I've, I know what a lion right. looks like. It's beautiful, you know, but there's nothing new. So what I tell people is, you know, who are worried that they don't have these $10,000 lenses, is I say, you know what, you might be better off without that. Um, you don't necessarily need to catch the elephant's yeah. eyelashes. What you might want to do, the photographs that... I am more attached to as time goes on are the ones that place the elements within a scene and tell a larger story. Right. And so this is a great example of that. This is a, uh, another park uh, in northern uh, Tanzania called Terengiri, and this is the Salale Swamp, and uh, the elephants come through there. And it's just uh, obviously it was after there's a rainstorm in the distance. Uh, the light was just amazing, and. You know, if I had zoomed in on one of the elephants, it just, it's nice. Would have been yeah, nice. But, but you've, I, you've done that a million times probably. And, I, and I've seen it and, and right. putting, would I have wanted to put that picture on my wall to look at day after day? This one I do. Yeah. This one I do because I just, so, I love the the feeling it gives me. Yeah. So Dave, when, when you're going on these safari tours and you're bringing your clients or your guests with you, they're yeah. bringing their own camera equipment and you're helping them enhance their composition. Can you share a little bit of insight to what that's like for our guests? So the variety, uh, the range of skill sets that come along uh, is that uh, fills the spectrum. So there are some people, uh, and there's there's another picture coming up, which uh, which is to this point. There are some people who need a lot of help from me photographically. You know, what is what is a shutter speed? What is what is aperture? How do I how do I compose? Like, they how, why, they why Google that before that? spending all that money <laughs> on right. camera equipment and going after? Why, why, why does this picture not look like this other picture that I love? Yeah. And, and we, it, let's talk it, about the S twenty one has got a good phone. It should be <laughs> <a good thing. laughs> but uh, and and those are the people. Uh, like, okay, let's let's go down to basics. I'm I'm here for you. This, this is why you're with me. 
Yeah. And uh, there are other people, they show up with the big lenses and they're, they are world, they're traveled very well. They've, they've mm -hmm. photographed around the world. What I'm there, the function I serve for them is a liaison. And they say, you know, Dave, the, the thing I'm missing from, um, is, is, I, pick a species. I, I, I'm missing bat-eared fox. Right. I want to see bat-eared fox tomorrow. So, okay, I, I go to the guides uh, that night. It's like, okay, tomorrow, let's make a plan for tomorrow. I know, uh, we know, based on our knowledge of bat-eared foxes, where they typically for, uh, put their dens. Uh, we know what time of day we want to be there for good light. We make a plan. And I'm going to set, th those people don't need my help pushing buttons or knowing what to do with their cameras. What they want me to do is put them in the right place at right. the right time. Right. And that's kind of what the, the trick is. So how much control do you have over the shots you're going to get uh, versus how much control does nature and the universe tell you what you're going to get? Mix. Yeah, it's a mix. Uh, yeah. I mean, I can, what I can do is tilt the odds, but I can't make any guarantee. Right. Yeah, of course. Uh, now here's a picture of a, a roaring lion uh, straight out of the opening credits of many movies over there. Okay, so so the first thing I'll tell you about this picture is I'm gonna. Uh, it, it was taken at the Animal Kingdom Park. <laughs> That's right. It does look like that. Yeah. Um, these are styrofoam rocks. Yep. Uh, painted by Imagineers. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, the the lion is, uh, its claws stuck in the styrofoam, which is why it's pissed off. <laughs> oh goodness. So the first thing I'll do is uh, is pull back the curtain and ruin uh, anytime uh, I'll ruin it. Uh, anytime yep. you see people share a picture of a lion or a cat doing this, the, the cat is yawning. Right. Yeah. There's no roaring going on here. No. Uh, but uh, we were in central Serengeti. It was sunset mm -hmm. and we were driving around and a great place to see cats in the Serengeti are these granite outcroppings called kopis because they, they climb up them, uh, they have heat from the sun during the day, which is nice, but they also are up high for visibility, both to yep. see prey, yep. to see where their pride is, so on. So we came around the Kopi and sure enough, there's this male lion sitting on top, uh, observing his kingdom. And, uh, and it was just an amazing event because he started calling to his pride, this, uh, you could feel right. it in your chest. It was just right. incredible, uh, incredible moment. And then, uh, and then he yawned. And so I yep. have this whole series of about 20 photos, high speed, just I could string them together. You cool. can see his mouth go like that. <laughs> That's that one that is an uh, awesome little known fact. The line is actually voiced by James Earl Jones. Everybody. That's right. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's true. But I love that you can see the ridges on the roof of his mouth. That's pretty it. freaking cool. I, that is a, a rare shot that I haven't seen before. So it's almost like one of those photos that we're familiar with, but with a little bit of a spin that adds a little bit more depth of interest to it. For, for it also me. reminds me of those memes you see where someone has stepped on a Lego in the dark. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that might be the worst pain in the universe. That's All right. So here is uh, one lone zebra. Okay. Um, probably happy he's not being eaten by a, you know, one of those lions lion. that are running around over there. So this is the photo I've uh, referenced uh, already. So this is in the Ngorongoro crater. Right. And usually when you see pictures of zebras, uh, people have uh, jammed a herd together, maybe black and white. The goal of the photograph is to emphasize all the graphic patterns and the stripes. Right. Why did I do this instead? Because uh, it's a beautiful photograph, yep. lone zebra and on the plane. It was taken with my, uh, three years ago, four years ago, with my iPhone 10. Wow. And when people say, can you take good photos on Safari with an iPhone? Yeah. Like I say, you're not going to get the wow. elephant eyelashes. Right. But, uh, but look, we're going to work within the limits of the gear you have. And I'm going to show you how to take great photographs. With wow. That. And so um, so here we are. Yeah, that, if, I, if I took my mom with me, she would bring one of the disposable Kodak cameras from the 1990s. With her. <laughs> for, for real. You know, she could take amazing photographs. With I know. Her. Right. All right. So this is a really, really cool photograph, in my opinion. Again, something mm -hmm. else I haven't seen before with the wildebeest coming out of the water and, and stuff. So uh, we've all seen Discovery Channel, Animal Planet, uh, this iconic event, herds of wildebeest, yep. 10,000 strong, crossing the Mara River in the northern Serengeti, which is what this is. Yep. Um, and we just, uh, our, our, our guide, uh, again, amazing, he read the room and he figured uh, when, they, when they do cross, they'll probably come up right here. Yep. And so he positioned the vehicle perfectly, broadside, the lenses are out. Uh, this is absolutely a waiting game. Um, 
yeah. What you'll do is you'll see a herd of about 10,000 wildebeest on the far side, and they are an incredibly nervous, skittish animal. Right. And uh, well, I would be too with all of those crazy the cats crocs in the, crocs yeah. in the water. And, and so we waited probably a little over two hours for them to even wow. budge. Wow. Yeah. That's Just patience. That's pretty wild. Yeah. So, so when you're out during the course of it, you've mentioned getting out for sunrise and then for sunset, are you finding that you're pretty much out all day? Are you taking some breaks in the middle of the day? You know, what would travelers anticipate mm -hmm. from this type of experience? Uh, great question. Uh, it's really, it, it depends on the goals for the day, how far away from the lodge or the camp we want to go and uh, people's energy levels and so on. A typical day, you get up before sunrise. Right. Uh, it's an early start because, uh, you know, the animals are like us. They don't want to be active in the middle of the day and direct. Right. Right. So you go out when it's cool, uh, sunrise, you'll probably get back to camp. If you're not seeing out all day, uh, you're back to camp. 10, 30, 11, all depends on what you see, how long you linger. And then you have lunch at camp. You can, whatever you want to do, you could, uh, you could nap, you could take a shower, you can hang out with everyone. Uh, and then around three 30, maybe four o'clock, you head out again for your evening game drive. Wow. Because the sun sets, the light gets better again. Midday light's not great. Uh, but the light gets great and uh, things start to cool down and the animals become active again. Wow. Absolutely uh, incredible. Next photograph. This is, this does not seem to be uh, Africa. <laughs> <laughs> this is in, actually, this is in Kenya last June. Uh, so this uh, female ostrich, um, I, this is, I threw this in there to, for the same reason. I, it's, you know, safaris aren't just elephants and lions and, and, you know, lions, tigers and bears. It's, oh my. Uh, you're going to see a wide variety of species. Mm -hmm. So um, ostrich, for example. That's pretty cool. All right. Last photograph that we're going to be featuring today. Elephant okay. with bird on his head. I think that's a, that's pretty cool too. Those, those tusks are <laughs> incredible. Yeah. So this guy, uh, so this is in Ambazeli National Park in Kenya. And um, if you've ever seen photographs where uh, there are long lines of elephants coming out of the horizon towards you and Kilimanjaro right. is in the background. It's, it's iconic. It looks like a painting. Uh, those were all taken in Ambazeli National Park. Wow. Um, and Ambazeli uh, has all the other species, but it's best known for its elephant herds. And, right. and also uh, lots of uh, large male elephants, tuskers. And this is one of them. His name's Tolstoy. And they give them names. And we, uh, this is just from last June, we, we um, tracked Tolstoy for three days and he was a very accommodating subject. That's pretty cool. So I'm just putting two and two together here. To go back to the Animal Kingdom reference. You called it a Tusker. They have a restaurant there called Tusker House. Now I think I know where the name came from. I never put two and two together. There you go. That's right. <laughs> All right, cool. Now is it common that their tusks are that long? So, well, well, Dr. Producer Suzanne, uh, yes, if you let them live, if right. they're a male uh, and they live this long, eventually their tusks will uh, grow that long. In fact, um, in the photograph, you'll see his left, from our view, his right tusk yep, I'll put it back is actually uh, blunter than yep. the tusk right. on our left. And the reason is it actually, it grew so long that um, he could not walk right. It was dragging. And right. the Kenyan Wildlife Service had to uh, come in and, and shorten it oh, for, wow. his, for his own health. Uh, I'm yeah. sure that was quite Makes a production. Sense. I would like to see it. Yeah, no no doubt. They probably they tranquilize the animal and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, um, I, I, Dave, I've got a, a, a question that I'd love a little bit more context and information on. Because yeah. um, when you talk about hunting some of these incredible creatures out there, right, there seems to be a lot of misinformation. It's very easy for us to say horrible, horrible thing. But then I hear that some of this stuff actually helps keep the species alive and protected in some sense. I don't understand any of this. I'm not coming down on a point of view on any of this, except it really makes me feel uncomfortable that we hunt these incredible creatures. Yeah. What do you see as, uh, as the reality of the situation that's happening in a lot of these African countries so we can have a win-win situation, I hope there? So uh, and by win-win, I mean animals staying alive. <laughs> right. So first of all, I, I am not an expert. I know some. Yeah. Um, uh, 
so I do not profess expertise. Yep. Uh, the, the challenge here is how complex this topic is. That's what I'm saying. And I don't even know where to begin and enter it. It's, it's easy for us to just say we hate it or whatever. Right. But right. it's not really so, dealing with the issue. So the answer varies, varies from country to country. Right. Um, it varies with the local politics. Yeah. Uh, there's still uh, literally tri tribalism going on. Yeah. But, and you were talking um, about the elephant that lasted so long. A lot of elephants in some of these countries are hungry and they go and they destroy towns and stuff like that. Well, so, like, like what common is they'll come into a villager's garden and yeah. they'll, uh, cause they're hungry. They want to eat the right. vegetables and it's easy pickings. Right. So, uh, they come in. And so now, uh, this villager who has never benefited from the wildlife, they just see them as pests. Right. Uh, they want that animal out of there. Uh, you course. know, the lions have killed my cattle. Well, how do you right. think I should feel about that lion? Mm. Um, I want it taken out. Or hyenas right. are just scum. Uh, well, right. you know, we know through science that hyenas, maybe they're not the most attractive animal, but they're a critical piece of the ecological cycle there. Right. But they're they're great to tell jokes to because they're easy laughs. Yeah, they, they just, you know, they laugh at yeah. anything. Yeah. Um, yeah so I, I would actually talking about food, right? And animals coming in based on where you're glamping. Mm -hmm. um, are there special precautions that you have to do to make sure that the food is not in smelling range for these animals to come close? Well, you as the guests don't need to take any precautions. Uh, your, your tent is animals haven't figured out zippers yet. Um, and things are buttoned up pretty tight at night. Okay. So the animals don't really come into the, uh, I'd say don't really, they don't at all come into the tents. Um, the camp staff, if it's a camp you're staying at, uh, I mean, the camp staff obviously has right. an interest in protecting their own food and their, and their kitchens. They don't want their kitchens demolished. So uh, they, they have all sorts of ways to keep food away from camp and keep it locked up and out of, uh, out of reach. Um, and then, of course, if you're staying at a lodge, which is, you know, permanent structures and so on. Right. Those That's things different. are pretty inaccessible. Yeah, pretty interesting. Yeah. What is the greatest interaction you've had photographing uh, an animal that immediately comes to mind in your career? Because I know there's got to be more than one. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. How do I pick? Uh, so um, the the cheetah hunt was pretty great. Yep. Uh, especially seeing the whole cycle. Yep. Um, well, I'll tell you, um, and this is a bit... Uh, this is a little bit for wildlife connoisseurs because it's not not the ones that eat the wildlife though. right right <laughs> uh it, because this is not a a scenario that involves um lots of iconic an iconic animal like a lion right just uh we were out at sunset just this last june in kenya and we heard a bit of a ruckus up the hill we turned off the road and drove up and there it became a menagerie there's there's two jackals barking what right. were barking at? They're around the hole. Out came a male warthog. Clearly, he had been injured. Um, but man, jackals can't do that to a warthog. So what's going on? And it's it was it's a little heartbreaking because the warthog yeah. is fatally injured, right? And struggling. And so we're watching. We're trying to. And so we think, well, the, it's there's probably a leopard in the area, um, and and sort of biding his time, right? And so we hang out, turn off the engine, let's just see what develops, and then. You know, you do this long enough, you get a short list of animals you haven't seen yet. Right. And out comes, I've seen loads of hyena. Right. Out comes what's called a striped hyena, which I've never seen in person before. Mm -hmm. It's like this black, big black and white shaggy. It, if you didn't know what it was, you'd look at it and say, what is that? Out came the striped hyena and out came the leopard. And the hyena actually ch <clears throat> chased the leopard up the tree. And it was just this... Uh, interactions then between the leopard and the jackals and the hyena and just it was this amazing scene like an episode of lion king <laughs> it was just <laughs> it was just incredible <laughs> just incredible. all the all the, the the dynamics it wasn't just one animal it was everything going on quite a scene all right here's a picture of a striped okay. hyena so everyone can take a look oh at it. good good job so the yeah. one we saw was more like the uh like the top left or, or you know bottom left yep very white and black uh and if it's shaggy. It's a strange looking animal. Yeah, sure is uh, kind of how people see me. That's strange. So Dave, yeah. talk about an opportunity where maybe you've had some type of equipment failure uh, <laughs> and how you survive that or help your guests survive that unique challenge. Uh, so earlier you showed a picture of a leopard hanging from a tree. 
um, I had, uh, I, I, that was two days into an 18 day safari and I had two camera bodies with me. And for the, for the serious photographers who, who, you know, don't want to experience equipment failure. I always say, look, bring a backup. Anything can happen and there's yeah. no repair facility down the road. So there I am and shooting away at this leopard, catching him in different poses and so on. And my camera freezes up. What's going on? So this is 2000, probably 12, uh, SLRs, you know, they have a mirror in them that flaps up and down. My camera freezes up. What's going on? I turn it off. I turn it on. The viewfinder's dark. Nothing's working. Pushing buttons. Finally, hmm, I took off the lens carefully and I looked in and the mirror is just flopping around. Right. It's completely detached. Well, this camera essentially is dead for the rest of the trip. Ouch. So what do you do? wrap up the mirror in a in a little cloth tuck it away put the camera away and it stayed there in the in the camera backpack for the rest of the trip and i had one camera body to to use for the rest of the two weeks so everything worked out just fine i got great photos but you probably fun. were like uh the, i got great photos but <laughs> what <laughs> did i get Right. <laughs> At least that's how I see the, uh, uh, the world. Uh, Dave, this has been really, really cool. Now, if people do want to do something like this, learn more about how they could join you on an awesome photography expedition to an amazing place in Africa. One of the places that you are going to be going this year. And I think you said, hold on one second. You said Tanzania, Kenya, Rwanda, maybe Botswana and a couple of other yeah. places as well. How can we learn more and find you, sir? All right. So my first suggestion is we do another one of these in a while where yep. I'm live from that's a lodge cool or something in Africa. Yep. Um, and then we can talk uh, about the hospitality side in addition to photography. But I know what you're asking me. Uh, look, uh, DaveBurnsPhoto.com is the website. Uh, mm -hmm. Dave at DaveBurnsPhoto.com is the email address. Uh, Instagram, DaveBurnsPhoto. Um, Facebook, DaveBurnsPhoto. And I'm on Twitter, Dave Burns Photo, but I don't do much there. That's, uh, that's awesome. Is it weird having Charles Montgomery Burns as your grandfather? No, it's excellent. <laughs> it's excellent. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, for putting, thanks for putting up with me for that really bad scene. No, that was on plan. I, I waited the whole hour. I <laughs> waited the whole hour to do that. <laughs> that's why we had you on the show all um, right dave hmm. thank you so much for being here absolutely tremendous photography thank um you. i hope to be able to join you one day it's actually a bucket list thing for me too Come along. we'll have a blast as soon as my kids graduate college in four to cool. ten years depending <laughs> on <how it> goes. <laughs> thanks for being right, with us guys, thanks for having me this was, nice, dave. this was just a lot of fun thank you sure i, I keep telling yourself that and hopefully You'll believe it one day. Yes, we are fun <laughs> over here. All right. Thanks, man. Really appreciate right. you. Take care, guys. Thank you. All right. That was so much fun, Suzanne. It was. Right? And, and imagine, like, I've actually gotten to see Dave in person. Right? I know. <laughs> well, being that I've, I've never seen Dave in person, I've never seen uh, I've never seen this elephant here in person. Uh, strangely, I did see the bird um, in in person at uh, Jones Beach over there, but um, <laughs> uh, also haven't seen you uh, in person. I know that's you know at least one 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 out of the three of us. It's all good. Oh, well, what are you gonna do? Maybe uh, maybe sometime this year I will see you. We should put that on our bucket person. list for twenty twenty two. I think we're gonna be down in. Orlando come May, and it's only a few hours from you. Maybe we could uh, make something. Yeah, we can happen. we can maneuver that. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> Meanwhile, while you guys wait for that maneuvering, I would highly recommend listening to the audio version of this podcast. Not necessarily today, it's because we're so visual, but most of them. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, wherever you like to get your shows. Well, golly gee, we are there. But for some reason, if we're not, drop me a line. I'm at Traveling Glenn. And if you want to talk to Anthony, he's at Anthony Hotels. How do we find you on social media? Find me at Suzanne Bagnera, and I am on Facebook, Instagram, and I'm down here at Indian River State College. We've got big announcement coming out today, too. Today? Yes, the college has um, got a promise award. The students in the four serving district counties, right. if you are a high school student and you graduate this year in May right. 2022, and you commit to our program by May 15th, we are offering tuition free what? as long as you stay committed to the program to earn your associates, 
your um, AA or your AAS degree um, wow. and maintain a 2.0 GPA. Like wow. that's about a six thousand plus dollar savings in that district. It's amazing. It's yeah, amazing. Yeah. Our president is awesome in trying to make sure that people in our service district are getting an education so they can return to the workforce and stay local. Wow. Super wow. proud to be Indian River State College. Another reason to move down to Florida right there for everybody. So uh, yeah. while you're thinking about reinventing your career and becoming uh, going to hospitality school at Indian River State College, of course, remember, you've only got one life, so blaze on, eh? Be kind to yourself. See you next week. But tomorrow, Friday, Friday night audit, 5 o'clock. And next week, Suzanne, oh, we're going to be everyone but you I, and Anthony will be at the California Logic Investment Conference. So yeah. that'll be Fun. I get ripped off again. It's yeah, okay. it sounds about right. <laughs> but, you know, you do have nice weather down there. All right, everybody. See you next week.